Well, as I said earlier, we begin this morning a new series of sermons. And it might be a little bit different from our usual series. Uh, Normally, uh, we take a book of the Bible and we work our way through chapter and verse, uh, largely in what you might call a broad brush stroke pattern, where we take fairly large sections Uh, trying to cover books of the Bible in in relatively short spaces of time. Uh, For instance, in our evening service, uh, we have taken 13 sermons to reach 1 Samuel 13, uh, so averaging one sermon per chapter. Uh, And that's rather like taking a speedboat and traveling across a great expanse of water. Uh, You might not feel like you're in a speedboat with 1 Samuel, but we're going fairly fast through it. And and there's much to be said for that approach. Uh, You're getting exposed to a lot of the Bible. Uh, You're getting to see something of the bigger picture of what's going on in the book. But of course, when you're traveling in a speedboat, you can easily miss the finer details. It might be exhilarating, yes. It might be an effective mode of transport, yes. But it's not the only way to travel across an expanse of water. A rowing boat can also do the job. Slower, quieter. But in a rowing boat, you can stop a little. You can peer into the water better. Uh, You can see what's happening under the surface a wee bit more. Things you would never see in the speedboat. So if you like, in in our morning services over the next few weeks and summer months, we're getting into the rowing boat. Uh, In the evenings, it's the speedboat. In the mornings, the rowing boat. And instead of zooming through a whole book, we're slowly rowing, paddling our way through just one chapter. Just one chapter, Romans chapter 8. And this morning, we aren't going any further than the opening verse of the chapter. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But before we... As it were, drop anchor on that verse. Let's firstly say a couple of things by way of admiration and introduction uh, to this chapter. So firstly, uh, we see a great admiration for Romans 8. We see a great admiration for Romans 8. Uh, Now, all of God's word is special, useful to the child of God. All of scripture is God-breathed. But there are some parts of the Bible that receive greater recognition than others. Certain mountain peaks of the Bible. And and Romans chapter 8 is one such peak Uh, This chapter has been and still is one of the most greatly admired chapters in all of Scripture. Some preachers uh, go so far as to say it's the greatest chapter in the Bible. Uh, Many quote a German author by the name of Spenner, who many years ago put it this way. If Holy Scripture was a ring... And the epistle to the Romans, a precious stone in the ring. Chapter 8 would be the sparkling point of the jewel. Chapter 8 of Romans would be the sparkling point of the jewel. It's described by Sinclair Ferguson as profound in theology, soaring in eloquence, and thrilling in in impact. Derek Thomas, uh, formerly of St. Millis Evangelical Presbyterian, he agrees. He, he preached a series of sermons entitled, The Best Chapter in the Bible, 
Uh, He says no other chapter in the Bible reaches the sustained levels or covers the same ground as Romans 8. John Stott says, Romans 8 is without doubt one of the best known, best loved chapters of the Bible. John Piper, Romans 8 is pervasively laden with the greatest and most glorious joy awakening facts in the universe. John MacArthur, to me, this is one of the most truly life changing chapters in the scriptures. It is a chapter every believer must understand. And one man of longer ago, Thomas Jackham, he was ejected from the Church of England with thousands of other evangelical ministers in the 1600s. He preached a series on this chapter. He said this, Search all the scriptures. Turn over the whole word of God from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And you won't find any one chapter into which more excellent, more sublime, more evangelical truths are crowded than this eighth chapter of Romans. He continues, the Holy Bible is the book of books. In some respects, this chapter could be the chapter of chapters. Blessed be God for every part and parcel of Holy Scripture. But in special, blessed be God for this eighth chapter of the letter to the Romans. So this chapter is highly praised indeed. And whether it's the greatest in the Bible or not, I will let you make your judgment on that. One thing is sure, it's up there. It is up there. It's what you might call a desert island chapter. If you struggle with guilt, you need Romans 8. If you struggle with sin, you need Romans 8. If you struggle with prayer, you need Romans 8. If you're going through trials, you need Romans 8. If you're struggling with assurance, you need Romans 8. And what better way to spend a number of weeks than paddling our way through this wonderful chapter? We see a great admiration for Romans 8. But secondly, we need a short introduction to Romans 8. We need a short introduction to Romans 8 because it's very apparent. This is right in the middle of a book, the letter to the Romans, which in itself is one of the most significant books in all the Bible. Uh, written by the Apostle Paul uh, to the church in Rome. Uh, and, and Romans is, as a book, it's dedicated to explaining the meaning of salvation by grace through faith. It starts out in the first three chapters outlining the sinfulness of man. And there's a lot of talk at the start about sin, punishment for sin, But then towards the end of the third chapter, Paul begins to unfold the gospel as the only solution to sin. And since the middle of chapter 3 or so, right through to the end of chapter 7, there's a careful discussion of what it means to be saved by the gospel. And the emphasis, particularly in chapter 7, is about the inward struggle every Christian experiences. Uh, For instance, verse 19 of chapter 7. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Each morning, uh, uh, this morning, uh, each of us who are Christians at all, we we know the struggle spoken of there. That, That struggle is real. 
But as chapter 7 moves into chapter 8, we find ourselves, as it were, plunged into crystal clear water. Deep water that brings healing to the struggling soul. Someone has said the turn from chapter 7 to chapter 8 of Romans is one of the most exquisite, most wonderful, most ecstatic turns in literary history. Because Romans 8 is a wonderfully glorious chapter that that speaks so strongly about the security of the believer. It begins verse 1 with no condemnation. And it ends with no separation. And in between no condemnation and no separation, there are truths we could spend a lifetime exploring. And we should understand that Romans 8 is full of truth after truth after truth. There is not a single command in this chapter. Uh, There isn't a single, uh, what uh, you could call, there isn't a single imperative. Not a single command. Just great and glorious truths that we should let sink into our lives. Truth. That should shape us, should change us, should influence us. Not least, truth about the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says a lot about the Holy Spirit. Uh, John Stott has noticed a comparison between chapter 7 and chapter 8. He says, if in Romans 7, Paul has been preoccupied with the place of the law, in Romans 8, he is preoccupied with the work of the Spirit. Romans 7, law, chapter 8, Spirit. So in chapter 7, the law and words like it are mentioned 31 times. Spirit only once in chapter 7. Whereas in chapter 8, The Spirit is referred to 19 times by name. Mentioned just once, chapter 7, 19 times in chapter 8. By far and away, Romans 8 is the chapter in the Bible that speaks most about the Holy Spirit. About life in the Spirit. And isn't that what we need, friends, when we're all too aware of the inward battle going on, the inward struggle going inside us as believers, and we feel so vulnerable to to temptation, to sin. Don't we need reminded of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, indwelling us, helping us, strengthening us? Romans 8 will do exactly that. So I hope and trust and pray that we're beginning to grow in our appreciation for this chapter. So there's firstly, we see a great admiration for Romans 8. Secondly, we need a short introduction to Romans 8. But then thirdly, and looking really at our verse for this morning, we find no condemnation in Romans 8. We find no condemnation in Romans 8. Paul begins this verse, There is therefore now no condemnation. With the word therefore, he's connecting with everything he's written thus far. He's following up on everything, the first seven chapters. It's it's as if he's saying, In view of chapters 1 to 7, in view of the fact that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, there is therefore no condemnation. And this is a strong statement. Uh, The original word, uh, sorry, the opening word in the original uh, is the word no in this sentence. It begins no 
No condemnation. We've taken that as our title for our address this morning. No condemnation. And those words should really leap off the page at us today. No condemnation. To help us understand them, we'll ask a few questions. Let's try and understand this no condemnation. Uh, We'll begin firstly by, by trying to clear some confusion. What does no condemnation not mean? That's the first question. What does no condemnation not mean? Well, Paul is not saying there will be no suffering. Every Christian should know that. In order to save us from being puffed up with pride, on occasions God will humble us with some kind of distress or another, some sickness, some heartache. Some prolonged delay in answer to prayer. Paul himself spoke of this thorn in the flesh. So he's not saying no suffering. Nor is he saying no disciplining. The Bible again clearly teaches those whom the Lord loves. He disciplines. And if we're not chastened, if we're not disciplined under the Lord's hand, you would question if you are God's children. Uh, He's not saying no disciplining. Nor is he saying there will never be ever condemning voices in our lives. And the truth is, sometimes men, women, sometimes they will condemn us. And sometimes justly. Sometimes our own conscience condemns us. For falling into the same sin again and again. Sometimes it's Satan condemning us. There isn't a single Christian in all the world. Who hasn't at times felt the condemnation of the devil. No hope for you he'll say. You're behaving so badly, God will never forgive you. You're just pretending. You're a hypocrite. Those flaming arrows of the evil one, Ephesians 6. Uh, We should remember he is a tireless accuser. That's one of his titles. The accuser of the brethren. Uh, The condemner, you might say. And so these opening words of Romans 8... They're not saying there will be no suffering, no disciplining, no condemning voices of any kind. It says none of those things. What does it say? Question two. What does no condemnation mean? What does this mean? Well, we've already covered the first word in the original is the word no. But it's worth adding The force of this no is extremely strong. It almost explodes in our face. No condemnation. None whatsoever. That's the force of what's being said here. Not even a hint of condemnation. Uh, This is a word from the law court condemnation. It means to consider as guilty. It means to pass the sentence of death. And Paul is saying that for some people, there is no condemnation, no sentence of death, no guilty verdict, none whatsoever. And though these people, they might see much in their life that discourages them. Though there might be much that grieves them, much that shames them in their life. Paul says, they are free from the sentence of divine condemnation. There is no condemnation. This is one of the most wonderful truths in the Bible, friends. That for these people, Paul's speaking about, God will never, ever condemn them. Never. He'll never reject them because they struggle. And even when he needs to discipline, he's not condemning. He's not condemning. 
And I know of few truths, friends, more important, more satisfying, more helpful, more liberating than this. No condemnation. How terrible is that notion that after death, that you would be condemned to purgatory for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, so that your remaining sin would somehow be purged out of your system until finally, through the repeated prayers and masses of of other people, you would somehow be released into heaven. In the opinion of Rome, that's what lies ahead of us, that we would be condemned to purgatory. But listen, listen, Paul says, there is no condemnation for these people. No condemnation. Nothing of God's guilty verdict hangs over these heads. Something has happened to bring the removal of God's righteous condemnation. So what does this mean? No condemnation whatsoever. But thirdly, you'll probably guess where we're going. For whom is there no condemnation? For whom is there no condemnation? Who are these people? That have this tremendous sentence lifted from them. Well this letter. It wasn't addressed to Nero in his palace. Or the Roman Senate. It wasn't addressed to the gladiators or or the the army. It wasn't addressed to the businessmen or the priests in Rome. It wasn't even addressed to the whole population of Rome. Nor was it addressed to all of mankind. We're told exactly who is delivered from condemnation. Our very text gives it. They are described to us as those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not speaking of perfect people here. Uh, This isn't referring to sinless people. Uh, These aren't people who have lived blameless lives. No, they are those who are united to Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. This connection to Paul is vital. These people who have been delivered from condemnation. Paul says, do you see They've got to be connected to Jesus. Every single one of them. That's the only way. You and Christ have got to be together, he says. If you go on living apart from Christ, then only one thing will happen to you, and that is you will be condemned. You cannot avoid that. Millions of better men and women than you and I have tried. And they're in hell today. They're in hell today. But those who are in Christ Jesus. Will be in the presence of God. In a new heavens and a new earth. Because of that union. Because of that connection. On the cross. Jesus bore the immeasurable burden. Of our condemnation. That weight of guilt. He was condemned In our place. He suffered the sentence. In our place. He satisfied God's justice. In our place. But he's not suffering condemnation. Any longer. And he never will. So neither can we. It would be impossible for God. To condemn Christ. A second time. And so it is for him to condemn a person who is in Christ. So do you see how important it is for you to be in Jesus? For you to be joined to Jesus forever and ever and ever. How do you get there? How do you do that? Well, the scriptures speak of believing in him. uh, Entrusting to him 
everything you are, all that you are, so that if God should ask you, why should I pardon you? Why should I accept you into heaven? Why should there be no condemnation over you? You can only say, because I am in Jesus. Because I am in Jesus. Think of the condemnation that came on the world at the great flood. That was a condemnation, wasn't it? Only eight men and women were saved from that condemnation. How? Why? Because they were in the ark. They were in the ark. They were safe there, secure there. All around them, there were torrents of rain falling, the great uh, deeps bursting forth. They were safe in the ark. So it is with sinners. Jesus must be our ark of refuge. In him, we are free from condemnation. Are you in him this morning? Are you in him? And are you not then thrilled beyond words to know that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus? For whom is there no condemnation? We have a fourth question to ask. Uh, What does this not mean? What does this mean? Uh, For whom is there no condemnation? This fourth one, when is there no condemnation? When? Uh, That is, is this all lying ahead of us? Is this all pie in the sky when you die kind of thing? Is this like having an all access pass for heaven? Uh, which only kicks in once you're dead. Well, the text is helpful. It it tells us uh, we could so easily miss this in the speedboat, you know. There is therefore now no condemnation. Now. Don't miss the significance of that. There is therefore now No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that you're in Christ, the very moment you're in Christ, living in him, he living in you, now you are eternally free from condemnation. Right now, this morning, as you sit here in this building, friend, there is no threat Of the God of heaven and earth condemning you. The moment you are joined with Christ. God sees no grounds of condemnation in you. And that's true of the very worst sinner. Who turns and entrusts themselves to Jesus Christ. From that moment. The Bible speaks of them as a new creature. Old things. Old guilt. Old shame. Old condemnation. Passed away. All things have become new. A new hope. A new expectation. A new future. Yes. There will be times we stumble. Times we mess up. But in Christ. We will never be condemned. Never condemned. And those condemning voices of other people. Those condemning voices of your conscience, even the devil. They can assault you all you like and sometimes rightly. But if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation from the Father. No condemnation from the Father. You are accepted in the Beloved. This is no grounds, of course, for loose living. It doesn't mean that you can live however way you want. The chapter will go on uh, to give a vigorous defense of what's called sanctification and the, uh, the progress in the Christian life. Nonetheless, all those in Christ, that very moment, God pronounces this irrevocable verdict. No condemnation. Just as Jesus said to the woman, 
who had been caught in adultery, John chapter 8. So he says to us this morning, Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. No condemnation. God willing, we'll come in future weeks into the kind of ways this will impact our lives. But but for now, this morning, let this truth sink deep into your soul. Look into these crystal clear waters. Let them flood into your heart and mind. No condemnation. Let them breathe life, light. Let them bring hope and help. Is Romans 8 the greatest chapter in all the Bible? I don't know. But will you not agree the opening verse alone puts forward a very good case? No condemnation. Amen.